All right, so about me. I work for DreamWit Studios as the support team lead. Um, I also do community and volunteer support. Uh, basically what I do is I manage my community. Uh, DreamWith is an independent community-based blogging platform that believes in privacy, accessibility, diversity, and freedom. Uh, we've worked from the Live Journal code base in 2008, and we are co-owned by Denise Palucci and Mark Smith. Uh, we have about 50 active volunteers at any given time uh, across various parts of the project between development and support, uh, documentation, and other things. Uh, about two-thirds of those volunteers are women, and about 65% had never coded before they came to our project. Uh, my actual job with DreamWith, as I said, is I'm a community and volunteer support team lead. I interface between the users and the developers, making sure that there's some sort of communication that both sides can understand. I point out bugs, I handle end user documentation. Uh, I'm basically just a friendly face, so if anybody has any questions, they can always come to me and I will point them in the right direction if I don't have the answer myself. Uh, so when I'm not working at DreamWith, I am an Allstate <laughs> insurance uh, agent. I'm a total loss rental coordinator for a three-state region, uh, as well as doing a lot of salvage work. And I also uh, volunteer with the Society for Creative Anachronism. The technical outline of my job for them is I'm the regional artwork procurement and distribution manager for North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, and everything north, which is essentially Manitoba. Uh, if you're in the SCA, that's called a signet. Basically, I make sure that people get pretty scrolls to go with their nice awards. It makes me really happy. Um, I manage about 30 scribes at any given time. Uh, I help them with their development, answer questions, a lot of the same stuff that I do with DreamWith. And uh, the last thing that I volunteer for is I'm an operations subhead in charge of interdepartment communication and liaison work with a 6,000 member science fiction convention, four days, Minnesota, super awesome. Everyone should go to Convergence because I love it. So let's get into what self-talk is. Self-talk is how we talk to and about ourselves. So sometimes that is internal and sometimes that's external. Uh, sometimes it can be a mix of both. A great example is actually this picture that I have of Clinton Barton, AKA human disaster, AKA Hawkeye. Uh, he talks to himself, he's like, Barton, you dummy. It was something he had no control over, but still he calls himself a dummy for it. Now it affects how you think about yourself, because if you think that you're a dummy, you're gonna, well, act like a dummy. You're not gonna hold yourself to the standards that you really should. Um, so the effects that it might have on your community are fewer contributions, higher turnover, less innovation. Um, people are more afraid to take risks when they're afraid that they're gonna look dumb or afraid that they're gonna be wrong. Uh, looking bad is a big deterrent, and so you need to model your community in a way that is going to uh, allow people to look good or not be afraid to fail. And we're going to get into that a little bit later here. So the ways that negative self-talk can display itself are things like imposter syndrome, fade out and burnout, and qualifying statements. Uh, I have this picture of a mildly terrified elephant uh, facing down a dragon. And a lot of times that's how I feel when I'm going into a situation where uh, I might not be comfortable or I'm not 100% confident in myself. I'm kind of like, oh no! And elephant, because you know medieval illuminations are kind of my jive. All right, so imposter syndrome. Who here has heard of imposter syndrome before? Yay, well we're gonna go over it anyway. <laughs> Imposter syndrome is that sinking feeling that at any moment, everyone in the room is going to know that you're faking it. Yeah, that's me right about now. So it's, you're not alone, believe me. Uh, it's pretty pervasive across industries and across locations. Um, it does tend to happen more often to minority groups or perceived minority groups, uh, women, people of color, uh, disabled, et cetera, and so forth. Um, now, there's a lot of social reasons why it affects women in minority groups more often. I'm not going to get into that. That's a completely different talk. Uh, but the social reason for women is that they're seen as being more submissive in general. If you've ever met me, you know that's not the case. But uh, that is the, the general perception across societies. Um, it tends to affect intelligent people with really high standards for themselves. Um, you know all the things that you don't know and you discount the things that you do know. Um, imposter syndrome also reduces the ownership of the successful endeavors. So the things that you've done that are great, that are amazing, 
you say, oh, that was just chance. Or, oh, I mean, I didn't, uh, I guess I didn't really have anything to do with that. And when something fails, you take that on yourself and say, oh, that's all my fault. I'm a terrible person. I did this wrong. This is my fault. And that burdenship of ownership is heavy. It takes up a lot of mental space. Um, that mental space means that, or that lack of mental space rather, means that you're not taking as many risks as you might want to because you can't handle that burden of what if something goes horribly wrong. Um, and it reduces innovation because being wrong means that everyone's going to know that you're a fraud. Burnout and fade out, uh, specifically due to negative self-talk. Um, you spend a lot of brain cycles on those what ifs. So if you're not feeling comfortable with yourself, you run through all possible scenarios and you do it constantly like, well, what if I wear this or what if I do this or what if I submit this now or what if I do it this way? I mean, who here has read over an email that they're about to send 17 times to double, there we go. You just keep reading and keep reading and try to make it so that you're not gonna, you're not gonna fail. And that's just, it's really hard. It hurts my heart when I have to do it. Um, and so you get those brain measles that are in there. They're just kind of flipping around and not being very nice at all. Uh, keep saying you can't do this because there's that, that possibility that you might fail. Or more to the point, there's a possibility that you have failed. It's a perceived failure, but you haven't actually done anything wrong. The thing that happened is just fine. It's just not what your brain had decided was the right thing that was going to happen. And even if it's a little bit different, that can cause a lot of self-doubt and anxiety uh, that makes those brain weasels kind of get worse. And that makes you want to step back from a project. If something's causing you a lot of stress, you don't want to do it. It's just flat out. That's just how your brain works. If it's stressful, you shy away from it. And that's not how you want your project to be. Um, when you fail, you think that everybody hates you and that it's time to go and that you're just done. Because clearly, once you've failed once, then everybody knows that you're a terrible failure and can never do anything right. Uh, this can also cause procrastination. Uh, a lot of procrastination because you feel like once you get started, you're going to get stuck. But if you never start, then you can't get stuck. And it's very, it's twisted thinking. Your brain's not telling you the right thing here. The best thing to do is to get started right away, which everybody knows, but nobody ever does. Hence why I was working on my slides last night. <laughs> it's mentally exhausting. It absolutely is. And so you keep putting stuff off. And then once you've put it off long enough, you don't feel like you can get back into it. Because if you come back after you've been gone for three weeks, six months, when you come back, you're going to feel like everyone's going to be staring at you and saying, well, where were you? Why weren't you there? That you let everyone down. Even though most people are just going to be really happy that you're back, they're going to be excited to see you. But your brain doesn't realize that. Uh, when you feel like you've burned every bridge, there's no way to come back from that. One second. So the next thing we're going to talk about is qualifying statements. So a qualified statement expresses some level of uncertainty about its own accuracy. I cribbed that right from Stack Exchange because I couldn't state it any more clearly. Uh, those tend to be things like deferential statements, like, oh, it was just a small patch, or it didn't take that long, or sorry, I know this is a dumb question, but, or maybe you should maybe think about possibly trying it this way. Have you maybe, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to, to bother you. Uh, or, uh, yeah, and I, I guess that's why that, that works. I think, you think? I, I think so. Um, or my favorite, I don't know. Maybe you should try it this way. It's just an idea I had. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to go now. And that reduces your ownership um, of what you're saying. And it softens the impact of what you're saying. And so when you use those deferential and qualifying statements, it really means that you're discounting everything you have to say. You're telling other people that what your thoughts are aren't important. And that's not good. That's bad. I'll flat out say it. That's not good. And it is also bad. Um, when you decrease that confidence in your statement, you're also decreasing the confidence that you have in yourself. Because you're telling other people that you don't know. Even though you do, you do know. So. Now that we know how it shows up, what are we going to do about it? So the basis of negative self-talk is the disconnection between the way you see yourself and the way you're seen by other people. What you need is a better mirror. You need to create an environment where people can reflect accurately 
what they're putting out and what you're getting out of what they're putting in. Um, it generally helps to have just a positive environment. It doesn't need to be unnecessarily upbeat. Uh, my office at Allstate, when I started working there, I seriously thought that I just walked into like the Stepford compound. Everyone was cheerful and happy and bouncy and it was a little strange because I'm, well, I wasn't used to it. Uh, but now that I've been there for a little bit, I found that it's really nice to have that positive environment where I can put stuff in and then get stuff back out that is an accurate reflection of what I'm doing. Um, so just be friendly and be accepting and help mold your project and the community that you're working in to be friendly and accepting. Um, so the way to do that so that people can get that bounce back that's accurate is to provide external validation because external validation leads to internal validation. The things that other people do to you and for you affect the way that you think about yourself and the things that you do for yourself. So external validation items, I'm gonna go through a list of several of them. Um, please feel free to raise your hand if you have any specific questions. Um, the first thing is kudos and positive feedback. So those can be tangible and intangible, uh, things you can physically hold in your hand or things that are just exist in your mind or on the internet that aren't necessarily tangible. Uh, the first example that I like is the archive of our, archive of our own kudos system. Is everyone here familiar with archive of our own? All right, Archive of Our Own is a fan fiction archive. Um, it is one of the largest in the world. Um, it's run by a nonprofit organization called the Organization for Transformative Works. They are run primarily uh, by women. I think almost everyone who works on that project is, um, is a woman and it's a, a major project. So when you read a piece of fan fiction, there's a button at the bottom. You don't have to be logged in to use it. Anybody can press it. And what it does is it sends kudos, just a little email notification to the person who wrote the story. And it says, hey, I really like this, thank you. And that's all, I mean, it's just this little tiny thing. But, I mean, that's just qualitative. Somebody thought that this was good, and that is awesome. And so you get this little thing, and it's super awesome. But then it's also quantitative, because it's not just that one person who's clicking it. It's 10 or 50 or 60,000 people clicked on this little button and told you that the thing that you made was great. How nice would it be if every project had something like that? Just a little button where you could just press it, no effort on the, the part of the person who's pressing the button, but the person who did the work can get that and say, yes, okay, somebody appreciates the thing that I did, the thing that I poured my heart and soul into. Uh, something along those similar lines that we do at work, uh, my manager, at Allstate uh, has these things called TOTS tokens. They are Monopoly money with his face plastered right in the middle. And it says TOTS token. And we get them for all sorts of things. For meeting baseline metrics, not anything spectacular or outstanding, just hitting that baseline. Uh, so good call times, good customer surveys, doing our job well. And sometimes he just comes over and is like, you know what, you look like you've been working really hard this week. Here, have a TOTS token. And it's great, people pin them up on their walls. And once you collect like five of them, you get to go into the tots drawer. The tots drawer is amazing. It has bouncy balls, it has silly putty, it has like these little knockoff rubber Batman ducks. They're so cool. And they have no real inherent value. They cost cents to purchase. But when I was having a bad day and I had just gotten off a terrible call and I was having just a really hard time feeling good about myself, I went and cashed in my tots tokens. I got this ridiculous little duck and he's on my desk and it just every time I look at it, I think, yeah, you know what, I did earn that. I worked really hard and I did a good job. So while it may not be financially valuable, it means a lot to me. Something that DreamWith does is uh, we have DreamWith points, which one of our developers calls fake DreamWith money. And uh, they're given to volunteers for doing stuff, sometimes trivial stuff, sometimes for big stuff. Uh, you can use them to buy services on the site. So icon slots or paid time, they're not physical, but they're still meaningful because somebody has to pay attention to be able to give them to you. And that's nice knowing that, hey, somebody was looking at that thing that I just worked really hard on. Great, that's awesome. Uh, we also have Dream with support points, which are a little bit different. So there's just an indicator that shows up on your profile that shows how many support requests you've answered. Um, older requests have more points and newer requests have fewer points. And they're not given, really. Uh, when you get answer a support request and that request is closed, then the points are automatically distributed. But it provides that metric, so you can kind of see where you're 
comparing or where you stand with other people so that you have a better understanding of, OK, yes, I did have an impact. I answered 50 support requests in the last six months. And you can kind of look at that and, and feel good about yourself seeing that tangible explanation of that thing that you did that was good. And now that is purely quantitative, but it's nice to have a nice round number. So like when I was at 950, I was keeping an eye on it like every day. And I would race other people to go and get those support requests before anybody else got to them. And then I could get my, my number up to 1,000. And I was not the first person to reach 1,000, but I was pretty close. And so that made me feel really good about myself. Uh, let's see. So another thing that DreamWith does is something called code amnesty. Uh, in our database, every once in a while, maybe like once or twice a year, we go through and we look at what pieces of code haven't been touched um, and what people haven't been particularly active that might have multiple claimed bugs or issues. Uh, and then we just ask them if they're still working on it. Are you still working on this? Great. Are you not working on it? That's totally fine too. Is it okay if I unassign you or were you maybe thinking about working on this at some point in the future? And if they're not planning on doing it, there's no harm, no foul. Um, it's a reduced guilt environment to say, you know, I think I bit off a little bit more than I can chew. I am I'm, I'm going to go ahead and let this drop. Now, it's not a guilt-free environment. There's no such thing as a guilt-free environment, unfortunately, because everybody's brain is going to process information differently. Um, but it does make it pretty clear that when you step back from a bug and you say that, no, I really can't handle this, and nobody's going to be mad at you because we're actively telling you, no, it's OK. We're thankful that you worked on this project. Thank you for helping us. Please let me know when you're ready to start again. Another thing that your project can start looking at, uh, this is starting more into like the structural changes that you can make, are things called, um, well, it's minimal group paradigm. And basically, uh, minimal group paradigm is the minor connections that people make based on arbitrary characteristics, uh, things like shirt color. I saw this on Tumblr a couple days ago when I decided to put it into my, my slides. So the blue guy walked in and stopped and was like, yo, stripes. And the red guy just started nodding and was like, yeah, stripes. They sat together just because they were both wearing stripes. So that's the minimal group. Uh, they have nothing in common other than that shirt connection. But if you can help people establish those minimal connections, they will eventually build up into something a lot stronger. Uh, so help people establish those minimal groups. Things like icebreakers. Everyone hates icebreakers. But the problem is they're actually really useful. Because you find that the person sitting next to you at work is from New York. And oh my gosh, I'm totally from New York. Where in New York are you from? Oh, I'm from Brooklyn. Oh my gosh, me too. And you just keep finding those little connections until you have formed a stronger bond. Now, those aren't particularly uh, durable, necessarily, but they can be. You can make them become more useful and strengthen your community by, by helping create those. Uh, primarily because when people know things about other people and they have that connection, that creates a safe space. And when you have a safe space, you have more ownership that's spread across a larger group. Because if you're having a problem, you can go to your buddy and say, hey, you know, I don't know if you know anything about this or not, but I'm really struggling with this thing. And by creating that safe space, you're making it OK to ask for help. So another thing you can do is to encourage stretch positions. And what I consider to be a stretch position is as the analog to that can that's on the top shelf that I can't quite reach. But if I stand up on my tiptoes and put my knee on the counter and I reach and I reach, I can get to it. And so I consider those stretch positions uh, as something that is not necessarily easy, but it's also an easy way for me to get experience and to figure out what I know, to show other people what I know in a low stress environment. Because let's face it, if I can't reach that can by myself, I'm going to go grab a ladder. And that's OK. And making it OK. Um, so the best way to use stretch positions is to promote from within. So take somebody who's already active in your project who looks like they might be ready to take the next step, or who looks like they might be struggling. Because when you give somebody a project and you say, hey, I think you would be great at this. You are providing that external validation for them saying, yes, I think you are worthwhile. You are a person who I can trust to do this thing, even if it's something really simple. Something like, hey, I see that you uh, 
that you wrote this code and this person over here really needs some help in writing the documentation for it, can you please reach out to them? Can you help them with that? And putting them in that leadership position helps give them confidence. But it's an easy place where they can fail if they need to, and we are gonna get to that in just a minute. Um, so when you put somebody in that position, you wanna make sure that you're also doing active mentoring. So check in with them, see how they're doing. Create a place where they can say, you know, I'm just, I don't know what to do, I'm really confused, I don't understand, and you can say, okay, that is fine. Let's talk through it. What's the first thing you're confused about? Uh, you can do one-on-one, -on -one, sit bys check-ins. Uh, just be receptive for the feedback that they're giving you about where they feel comfortable, and be, be flexible and able to adjust that leadership position to something that might be a little bit more tailored to them. You want to encourage self-evaluation so that they can look and see what they're doing themselves, and now you also want to make sure that you are allowing for failure. Now, I have some silly moving pictures here, so if anyone has issues with those, you might want to close your eyes. I'll tell you when they're done. So this is Chris Evans, who is Captain America. Oh, they're not actually moving. Oh, well, anyway, he's very adorable, so we can just go with that. Uh, he says, I used to be really very hard on myself if I thought I wasn't accomplishing something or reaching a certain level. Be with your failures. They're just as educational and just as opening to the process as the success is. Your failures are OK, too. So when you have your project, that you've assigned to somebody, allow graceful failure. Allow them a way to back off and to say, I can't do this, to allow them to step down. Now, if things explode spectacularly in a massive way, that's OK, too, because it's a minor project. It's not anything that was necessarily project critical, uh, that everything is going to fall down if it explodes. It can be really helpful for something to go terribly wrong and for nothing else to go wrong. So if they fail at their little part of the project, the rest of the project isn't going to come cascading down. Uh, encourage quick failure. So if they have an idea that they think might possibly work, let them do it. Give them four weeks or six weeks or four days, depending on the span of your project, to do that thing and see if it's actually working or not. And if it's working, great. We're going to keep doing that. You did an awesome job. And if it's not working, you know, I think this isn't working. Are you kind of of that agreement? Yeah, me too. Okay, let's try something else. And just move on from it. Don't make a big deal. Just let it go. Uh, so the purpose of these minor projects is more self-exploration and development. The project itself is really, truly the secondary goal. You want to give people self-confidence so that they can conquer those bigger goals a little bit down the line. So you yourself can set an example about how to fail. Uh, you can fail publicly. And so when you make a mistake, put it out there. Tell people, yep, nope, I really screwed up here. And this is what we're going to do to fix it. And this is what I was thinking. And you know, everyone's going to learn. So uh, things real Dream With developers do is a page that we have on our wiki. And it has things like ask for help, make mistakes, forget how really simple things work. Uh, break things, break the dev hack, break production, on purpose, twice. <laughs> uh, and so this page has testimonials from various project contributors. Uh, they're all self-contributed, so we're not going after people or putting up things without their permission. Uh, but it showcases the ridiculous things that we do and the absolutely horrific mistakes that just happen sometimes. Uh, so for example, my own one that I put up here is, I legit can't answer support requests without looking up the doc or referring back to my notes. I've only been doing this for five years. You would think I would know these things, and I really don't, and that's fine. I just put on a nice, glossy cover, and everyone thinks everything's great. And behind the scenes, there's just a bunch of screaming monkeys. <laughs> so by setting up that uh, public failure, it establishes that even the people who are showing you the ropes make mistakes. We laugh. We move on. The sun sets, and the sun always rises again. And what looks smooth to you might actually not be smooth, and it's going to be fine. Everything is going to be just fine. It's OK to be grumpy with yourself. Just come into IRC and tell us all about it. And I promise that you will find at least two people to commiserate with who have done that exact same thing within the last two years. You're creating that minimal group paradigm. You're strengthening that community structure by showing the person who's having trouble that there are other people who are also having trouble and making it OK that they're having trouble. 
So another external action item is to reduce qualitative statements. It's never just a patch. Uh, every contribution that anybody makes is valuable and important in some way. So recognize what's happening when they say, oh, it's just a patch, or oh, no, I mean, it's not really that good. Or, so validate the contribution. So when they say, sorry, I just thought maybe this might work, I don't know, I'm, I'm sorry. Just say, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. And I can definitely see where you're coming from on that. Even if you can't, try to figure it out. Because they might be onto something. Who knows? They might be completely off base too. And that's OK too. Because once you say, yeah, I can see where you're coming from that, can you walk me through your steps about how you arrived at this, this conclusion? Then you have this, this concept from them. And you can see how their brain is working and how things are fitting and how those cogs are going together. And you can help them get better, which is the whole point, really. Uh, another thing is when they say, this is a dumb little thing. It's not really important. You can say, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Don't say, it's not a little thing. Because that's invalidating their, their own opinion. You can say, my opinion is that I appreciate you taking the time to do it. I can tell you put some thought into this. Thank you. Uh, so when you say, like, this is the dumb thing, or it's not dumb, as I said, that's invalidating their statement. It kind of causes this really nasty downward spiral. Um, another thing you want to stay away from is well actually statements. So that not only invalidates, but it belittles uh, their contribution. It also devalues the usefulness of the conversation that you're having. And let's be honest, it's really argumentative. So if somebody says, I did this wrong, you don't say, well, actually, no, it looks fine. That's telling them that you don't agree with them. Uh, in a way that's not constructive. So I have this little coffee cup up here. And if you can't read it, it says, stay up late, get up early, keep going until the lack of sleep causes an emotional breakdown that sends you spiraling into a dark abyss. Yeah, on second thought, how about, yeah, I'm going to say no. Uh, that's, not, that's not the way to do things. No for this is a valid answer. Um, if someone needs to take a break, that's OK. Just let them go. Stretch breaks. Are good. So if you're coding really hard and you're stuck on something, get up, walk around. Don't tell somebody, no, you should just keep working on this. Well, clearly they've been trying and it's not working, so get up, move around, take a second to refresh. Okay, we're going to come back to it with a fresh set of eyes and you're going to feel better about it once you've come back to it. Uh, vacations are also good. Encouraging people to take their PTO. If somebody has 12 weeks of vacation racked up at the end of the year, that is not a good thing. That is, in fact, a bad thing, because it means they're not getting time to reset their mental capacities and to get their brain back into a good place. Because if you focus on work all the time, all you're going to see is the negative. You need to take a break, look outside. Uh, if you don't want to look outside, go watch the Avengers for the 17th time. That's totally OK. So as self-care cat says, self-care isn't selfish. But even if it was, it's OK to be selfish sometimes. And you just need to remember that when you're working with people who may not be able to stare at a computer for 22 hours. Ooh. So that's all great, but what about internal validation? So my mid-year resolution this year was to stop making qualifying statements. And as you heard earlier in this talk, I was talking some pretty nasty qualifying statements about myself. So my goal now is to immediately restate those without qualifiers. So when I'm explaining something to someone, and at the end of the conversation I say, I mean, I guess, I don't know, what do you think? I say, no, you know what, I do know. That is how it is, and that's just the way that I'm, I perceive the situation. What do you think? So rather than invalidating myself and then making myself seem submissive and demurring to the opinion of the other person who's clearly more important than I am, I say, no, you know what, I'm an important person too. I am worthwhile and I am valuable, and my opinion counts. So you're going to listen to it whether you want to or not. Um, it makes me a little bit more assertive. It does make me seem a little bit more bossy, but Honey Badger don't care. Really don't. I'm important, uh, and while it might be polite to demure praise and to say, no, that wasn't that good, or no, I guess that, I mean, no, it's fine. I just, it was really easy. I didn't, I didn't work very hard on it. Politeness can bite it. I'm not always right, and I don't always think I do a good job, but I am right more often than I think I am, and I do a good job more often than not. So when I'm right, or when I'm not right, excuse me, or when I actually did a bad job, it's OK to admit it. 
and I just say, you know what, I really screwed up on that. I'm sorry. Let's figure out a way to fix it and be proactive and just move forward with it. And I found that having that mental shift between going to somebody on my knees and groveling and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I completely screwed this up. I just say, yep, you know what, you're totally right. We're going to fix this. Uh, can, we, can I get back to you in a couple days with a plan? Does that work? OK, great, let's move on. I find that it takes up a lot fewer mental cycles. And so I'm not spending days and days thinking about how they didn't believe my apology because I have something proactive to move forward on. I have steps that I can take that are going to get me past this point where I am. Oh, and I've made a decision that I'm only going to apologize when I actually mean it. Uh, so being more assertive means that you have better opportunities. So rather than saying, hi, sorry to bother you. I was thinking about this process that I guess Florida's using. I think maybe it might be a good thing here. Uh, I guess maybe we can evaluate maybe next month. I'm sorry, I'll go down. You say, hey, boss, let's look at implementing this process next month. I did some research, and the Florida office has had some great results. Let me know when you've got some time to talk over the logistics and review the data with me. Thanks. Do you see where that difference is? We're coming at it from a more a standpoint where I'm on both feet. And I have my shoulders set, and I'm going straight forward rather than trying to sneak around the issue. I'm done. I'm done with sneaking around the issue. I'm important, too. And it's been working so far. So that's got to say something, right? Uh, another thing that I do is I have some self-directed positive feedback. So when I do good things, I will literally say out loud to myself, good job, Kat, four for you. Like, actually say it. My boss peeked up over the cubicle. I was like, what are you saying? I told myself I did a good job. Oh, OK, well, you did do a good job. OK, bye. And it totally works. Um, also, having those transient rewards, like when I get this done, I'm going to go take a walk. Then I have that reward, and it shows myself that I've done something positive because I'm away from my cubicle, which is awesome. So interactive time. Everyone get out your writing utensils. Um, and if you don't have one, that's OK. We'll uh, you'll be able to figure, computer is totally fine. I count that as a rating implement because it makes little symbols that also are words and it's fantastic. All right. Is it possible to do this mentally? You can totally do this mentally. I find it is a little bit easier if I have it written down, but you are totally fine to do it mentally if you want to. All right, so everybody think about the most recent project that you did. It could be something really small, like making dinner, making travel plans, writing code, uh, doing laundry, uh, getting dressed in the morning, your weekly time management is a big one that I like to go and look back on. All right, I think everyone stopped typing and stuff. We're going to move to the next one. Oh. oh, yeah, so write it down. Sorry. Ah. Yep, you're just going to write down that project. Yep, and now you're going to write down three things that you liked, that you did well, and that you're proud of. Doesn't matter. Just three positive things about your experience doing that project. Something that you think you did well. Something you're really proud of. Um, like when I do calligraphy, sometimes I'll say, you know what, that letter A in the second line, like the fourth one in, looks fantastic. Just something little. All right. Now you're going to write down two things that you're not happy with, two things that you want to do better, uh, that you want to improve for next time. Just two. Sure can. Oops. And again, these can be little things. Like, you know, my letter B was a little bit slanted when I wrote out that line. All right, we're going to move to the next one. I want you to write down or think of one thing that you can do differently next time. <coughs> All right. So did anyone? find that to be a little useful in helping you get a way forward? I see a couple hands, so that's good. So the why of 321. Uh, 321 is self-guided. It's the things that you're thinking about yourself. 
Um, it's not anything that anyone else is telling you about. It's a, a way for you to do some self-evaluation in a constructive way uh, without any judgment. It also sandwiches the criticism in the middle with those two items with positive things. So the first three things are things you did well. And those two negative things that you need to change and then a positive action item that you can do going forward the next time you do this thing. It might be as simple as, you know what, I'm going to start doing this the night before rather than doing it the day of. Um, something along those lines. And having that action item provides a path. And it gives you somewhere to follow rather than spinning in circles and letting all of those what ifs rain down on your head. When the positives outweigh the negatives, even when it's just in the way that they look on your list, you can see that there's more positives there. And I don't know why, but it clicks over something in your brain that says, you know what, I actually did do a pretty good job. I did work really hard on this. And you know, I might not have done it perfectly, but there's always next time. There's always the next time. When you have that path to move forward, it doesn't leave you sitting and spinning. Um, and this does have some pretty flexible application. Um, I've used it with art. I've seen people use it with code, with weekly management, with daily management. Pretty much anything that you do that's an action that you do, it allows you to, to have that path. Uh, so the results that I've seen by using 321 and some of the communities that I work with is increased participation, increased quality, and improve self-awareness because it gives you a better mirror. It's not just the mirror that other people are feeding back to you, it's the mirror that you make yourself. Um, it's also introspective. So you're thinking about what do I think of me rather than what do they think of me. Because other people's opinions of yourself are really, truly less important than your own opinion of yourself. If you think you're awesome, then everyone else is gonna think you're awesome too. So when you have somebody that you work with doing that 3-2-1 technique, uh, what do you do with that information once they give it to you? Uh, the first option is to do nothing. To say, you know what, thank you for going through that. Let me know if there's anything that I can help with. Provide the assistance if they want it, but then don't force it on them because they might not need it. You can also offer to provide another perspective. So especially on those negatives, you can say, I think you did a really nice job on that. I can see where you, where you might feel that you've been having some difficulties or struggling, but I can tell that you worked really hard. So thank you. Is there anything that I can do to help you in the future? Um, but don't comment on those positives. Only combat, or contact, comment on those negatives. I'll let the pride in, that people have in themselves, just let that stand. Um, and then you can apply those external techniques that we talked about earlier as necessary if they seem like they're fitting and if the person actually wants you to say them. And so in conclusion, Negative self-talk is a thing. It's going to happen. What matters is what you do with it once you've noticed it. I have faith. You can do the thing. I'm a tiny potato, and I believe in you. You can do the thing. Are there any questions? <laughs>